All righty, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the series Mud Talks, Building Worlds, Understanding the Game Industry with Renee Gittens, Class of 12, and Ed Fries, Parent 24. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. We thank you for attending today's event and we hope you're excited. This talk is being recorded and will be distributed after the event. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, and we will try to get through as many questions as possible. I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers to introduce themselves. Renee and Ed, the floor is yours. Cool, uh, I guess I can start. Hi, uh, my name is Renee Gittins. I'm from the Harvard Mudd class of 2012. I got my degree in engineering actually, and I am currently the general manager at Phoenix Labs, which is a uh, large, I'm currently the general manager of Phoenix Labs in Vancouver, uh, which is about 180 developers. Uh, we have four studios in total though. And I'm also the vice chair of the IGDA, the International Game Developers Association, which is a nonprofit organization that supports and empowers game developers around the world. And I'm joined today by Ed. <laughs> yeah, my name is Ed Fries. Um, I guess most importantly, I'm a parent of a kid at, at Harvey Mudd, my son Xander. So if you see Xander Fries, he, uh, you can give him a hard time. Uh, he's actually named after the Xbox, X-A-N-D-E-R. So. You can you can tell him his dad dad tried to embarrass him on the call. That would be good. Actually, Xander though is um, he's in his room with COVID right now. Oh, so, no. Yeah, so he just came down with COVID. So I'm sure he's going to be okay. But we're uh, I actually we're, had COVID last week. Admittedly, um, no symptoms. I just uh, had an exposure, so I tested positive. I, I tested it was positive and isolated for a week, but <laughs> all good now. So um, anyway, um, I've been in the game business, gosh, it's practically my whole life. I started making games when I was a kid in uh, high school in the early 80s and uh, uh, worked for a little game company in California for a while while I was going to college and then went off and went to Microsoft and had a long career at Microsoft, including launching the original Xbox. And these days um, I run a venture fund uh, called One Up Ventures and we make relatively small investments in lots of game companies around the world and we connect the founders of those companies together to form a community where they can all help and support each other. Um, I'm also uh, one of the board members for the IGDA Foundation, which is the International Game Developers Association Foundation, and that's kind of the diversity non nonprofit arm of the IGDA uh, that Renee is part of. Doing important work for sure. <laughs> All yeah. right, Renee, what are we going to do? Well, I mean, <laughs> let's talk about game development. And um, I, I think I think Harvey Mudd and game development for me makes a lot of sense. Uh, most notably, I would say that I, of course, got an engineering degree. So my experiences were with programming were CS5 uh, and CS60. My, I took CS5, obviously, my freshman year and CS60 uh, my senior year. Um, but one of the reasons that I found the game industry appealing outside of being video games, which are awesome, uh, is that I was able to bring in so many different disciplines together, right? Like in games, you get to deal with obviously like, yeah, computer science and game design and art and audio and history and writing it's almost like anything that you could find interest in like if you're really interested in cooking you can make a game about cooking i feel like games are a perfect place to explore your interests and similarly i think because harvey mudd allows you to explore so many different parts of stems um like our engineering degree is so general because you get to explore many different parts of that and our humanities section is so flexible that you get to really like dive into a bunch of different uh, humanities classes that, that interest you. I felt that um, games had that same appeal to me that MUD did. Um, I don't know what MUD was like back when you went, um, but... Uh, I didn't have... go to MUD. <laughs> oh, right, right, your son, right, <laughs> in a different class. Um, yeah, but... I wish I, I went to MUD. <laughs> yeah, it's good, it's good school. Um, what do you see as the draw of being in the game development industry, actually? What could be what could be better than working in a game business? <laughs> I don't know. For me, it was like, uh, you know, I got involved with computers just kind of right when the first personal computers were just starting to come out, the Apple II, the 
Atari 800. That's what I had. And um, I just fell in love with programming and making games was just seemed like um, kind of a natural thing to do. I mean, at that time, arcades were just starting to take off and there were all these amazing arcade games coming out, um, kind of like kind of like in my office here. And, uh, and so um, they were sort of easy things for me to try to, as a young programmer, try to imitate, you know. Um, and so I would get excited about something and say, I could do that. I could build that and, uh, and then try to do it. And I think that's what I, I kind of fell in love with, with mud about. It's just the idea, you know, that it's a place where people make stuff. And I think that's who we are in the game business. We're, we're people who create things, you know, you, you, you found that great title building worlds for the, for our talk, you know, that's really, it's really so true. It's what we do. Um, and it's hard, you know, making games is super hard. I, I like to say it's like uh, kind of everything that can go wrong with a piece of software combined with everything that can go wrong with a piece of, you know, entertainment, like a movie. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. When it comes to games, I mean, I think the hardest thing is fun, right? Like yeah. games, you need to have that sense of uh, fun. It's not just functionality when you're creating other software, you know, it has a clear user story and purpose, um, but in games that is so much more intangible trying to discover like you have to play test you have to iterate uh and one of the challenges you know beyond fun is because there are often so many ways for users to interact you know it's not just you're going through a single set of ui buttons and there are only so many branches people can go down when people are interacting in these 3d spaces and running around i mean in vr for example in particular they can break all sorts of things uh, i know one of my friends was uh play testing half-life alex and found a puzzle frustrating uh and just leaned through the wall so you could see past the puzzle gate and then use the teleport on the other side uh they obviously saw that in the play test and blocked you from doing it in the future. Um, but it's all sorts of like weird things like that, that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily expect, but that you have to consider in games and that softness makes the, the development additionally difficult. Yeah. Um, and, and even beyond fun, you know, I remember vividly meeting a, a young game designer named Genova Chen, who was working on his first big game, um, yeah, it's technically a second game, but it was first really big game, a game called Journey. And he told me that um, that he wanted to do more than fun in games. The games could be beyond fun. Uh, they could be about other things than just fun. And right. that was, you know, that was kind of mind blowing to me. <laughs> you know, it's like it, it was it was mind expanding. I guess that that you know we could. Um, we could use this idea of interactive media to um, explore all kinds of topics, and you know. Um, I went to a talk years and years ago. It was from like 2014 or so, um, where somebody was saying that the best way to design a video game is to tailor it to invoke emotions, and that the way like. That can be the emotions of like a very satisfying headshot, you know, that feels good or like, you know, winning. Um, but it can also be the emotions of awe or sadness mm -hmm. or mystery. Um, and I think that's also a good way to look at it. You're right, fun is a little bit uh, simplistic for the, the range of what video games can do when it comes to, to sharing stories and experiences. Yeah, you think about, you, you know, those like the masks in, for theater, there's like a, a laughing and a crying. Oh, like, yeah. A mask that and that's, that's actually on this exact top topic. That's why those exist for theater is the idea that, that, you know, make the audience laugh, make them cry, you know, that comes out with the full entertainment experience, right. Um, and of course, we, we can do that in the game business where I don't think we're as good at crying yet as we are at the, at the laughing, honestly. Uh, but, you know, people remember, uh, you know, a certain death that happened in Final Fantasy VII is still very famous in the game business. And um, oh. I think I think we're getting better. We're getting better. Yeah. And of course, Last of Us has been uh, touted for its emotions in certain uh, parts of the game as well. And it's been a lot of... Yeah, I think of the games that Quantic Dream makes, you know, um, and they, they had one when I was a young parent. Um, 
and I tried to play this game, uh, Heavy Rain. And one of the first scenes, you lose your son in a mall, like you're going to the mall, you have your child with you and you lose them. And I couldn't play past that point. It was just too, it was too much like my life. It was too real. Um, uh, it's, um, it's amazing how, and I think this is the reason that games have grown so much. It's, it's you know, we're, we're really inventing a new, a new medium, uh, a new way to tell stories that um, it's much more impactful, you know, when you're, the, when you're the lead character, right? You're the one in charge, you're the one making decisions um, like that like that scene in the mall. It was it's too real for me. <laughs> into somebody else's shoes, like truly, right? It's not yeah. just telling a story, it is having to live that story. Exactly, it's it's more than just watching, watching a movie. Yeah, it, yeah, I think it is the best medium for empathy generation, really. Um, something that I've found compelling about the games industry um, is the, passion and interest of the people who are within it and i know passion can be a dangerous <laughs> word especially as an industry that is known for burning people out through through crunch and things like that but um i was in biotech before i got into games and mm. i enjoyed biotech i had interesting problems in biotech yeah. um going to a biotech conference is not like going to like a game <laughs> industry conference right like a biotech conference everyone's like yeah you know cool things maybe talk about what you're uh working on uh, at a game industry conference, like everyone is just like just so excited. They're like almost exploding with interest and the desire to collaborate and share and talk about these stories that they're creating and, and everything else. The, um, the amount of friends that I've created within the games industry through the shared interest has been the best benefit that I've experienced because I've met so many wonderful, nerdy, intelligent, passionate people <laughs> that are interested in a diversity of things and really like pursuing this strange medium together. And that's, that's why I don't know if I would ever be able to work in an industry that's not games because it would feel so uh, dull in comparison, I think. <laughs> Well, you know, I spent 10 years working on Office uh, right after college. <laughs> so I, was it dull? <laughs> I worked on the first versions of Excel and, and honestly, um, it was super fun. Well, there were, you know, great, great programmers on the team and I learned so much. Um, I worked on Excel for five years and worked for five years. I still run into people today that, you know, accountants, people like that, and be like, you worked on Excel. That's so amazing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I love that tool. Um, so you get some of that, but you're right. It's not, it's not like the game business. I don't know. Game people, when we get together, we, I don't know, it's like we found, we found each other. Uh, you know, I, I was, we just had our biggest conference of the year, of course, game developers conference down in San Francisco. I don't know if you had a chance to got to attend this year. I did. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. But for me, that, for me, that conference is like, um, I don't know. It's like re it fills me back up again every it, year. It's very invigorating. I'm, many, many people describe it that way. It really, yeah, recharges your batteries. Yeah, yeah. I go and then I just see so many people I know, and it's just like I can't walk two feet without. Oh, they're so and so, and and they're doing cool stuff, and we're doing cool stuff, and uh, yeah. I don't. I don't know. There's there's nothing like it. So I always always leave GDC with a big smile on my face. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I had an early morning meeting and then went to the, the park near the conference because uh -huh. yeah. somebody had spun up a like, mini side conference on um, generative games. Uh -huh. And so they're like, hey, I bought a bunch of bagels and some coffee and I'm just setting up a discussion for people who are interested and work in, on generative games. So whether that's level generation or anything else, like you want to talk about how you're doing that, come here. Uh, and I just love that type of passion and interest and like really like organic community organization of activities because of everybody being so involved, right? And passionate. Yeah, I, I think the game industry just, I think part of it's because what we do is so hard, you know, it's, it's incredibly competitive. 
Um, you know, now there's, you know, I don't know how many game teams all around the world. I mean, there's more than 400 right here in the Seattle area alone. Um, and, you know, it's, we're trying to build these very difficult products to make and the bar gets higher every year. We're always running kind of right at the cutting edge of what's possible on the hardware. We're using new hardware and, and new technology all the time, whether it's augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, and now you've got the web three stuff with crypto and we don't know where that's gonna go. And of course all the you know client server stuff happening, server side games, um, streaming. It's, it's, um, you're always at the cutting edge with games. If you're not, you're, you're probably, probably not doing it right. Yeah, both on the cutting edge of, edge of technology and of design. Uh, certainly, I think that indie games have shown that you don't have to be pressing uh, <laughs> right. the technical, like the technology side of things, but you can still make new, intriguing, interesting experiences. And of course, with one up ventures, you get to see that all of the time. Or you can do something crazy like go make a, a game called Halo 2600 for the Atari 2600. But like I did like 10 years ago. <laughs> did, you, did you really? I, I didn't hear yeah. about that one. Do you know about that? Yeah. No, that's yeah. great. You'll have to look it up. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure to Google it. Um, but I mean, it doesn't mean that the game industry isn't without its challenges, right? You know, um, we certainly, I, I believe that we're certainly on the road to improvement in many ways. The IGA, of course, runs the developer satisfaction survey. We've seen crunch in general is going down, uh, diversity and representation is going up. But when it comes down to it, still only 24% of the workforce in games um, identifies as women. Uh, we have maybe 2% of the game developers uh, are Black. You know, there's many places where we can still improve there. Um, I would love to hear your insights, even particularly with your participation in the IGDA Foundation of what we can do to improve and the current state of our industry. Yeah, in fact, before I forget, let me let me post a link to our IGDA Foundation programs. We're just launching something called the Virtual Exchange that we do every year. And there's four different programs inside of that um, that most people will find um, that they fall into one of the, the four categories. Um, and basically we take people who wanna want to get careers in the game business or are in the game business and wanna grow in their careers in the game business and um, run these six weeks, six week programs that um, uh, connect them with more experienced people and training and connections into new companies and things like that. So it's a great program. It's really for bringing uh, people with all kinds of, you know, all kinds of diversity into the game business to increase the diversity of the business itself. Diversity is also a focus of, of the venture fund that I run, one of ventures. We've made 42 investments to date, uh, more than a third uh, female founder, uh, more than 50% of the companies we've invested in have at least one diverse uh, founder or co-founder. Um, so yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to get there from where we were back when, when I was starting out in the early 80s, you know, all, all, all game companies were run by programmers, you know, and they were generally uh, white guys like me. And so, you know, the industry started sort of started like that. And it's been, um, you know, it's been an effort to make our industry look like our audience. And that, that I think is really our goal. The audience of game players has become incredibly diverse as we've grown to the point where almost everyone is a game a gamer at this point. The term gamer almost doesn't mean any anything anymore. It's I, it's like being a movie or, or something. I, I, I yeah. watch movies, you know. It's like, yeah, okay, good for you. Um, but so you know, more and more we look like the population of the U.S. Right, um, right, our, our audience, and so um, and we're not there yet with the when you look inside our companies and if you want to make games for a diverse audience you have to have diverse game designers and diverse artists and diverse programmers you have to have all of that because the whenever you create something it it reflects your own experience and who you are yeah absolutely um 
as as you know, I have my own studio on the side uh, and working on a game called Potions of Curious Tale. And when I made that game, I was like, oh, well, it, it, it's a lot like Zelda. So I guess my target audience is going to be 18 to 35 year old men because those are people who tend to really like Zelda, right? Well, what I didn't consider was that I am a woman and I made a game that would appeal to me. So there's lots of elements of like that you know, action adventure, but the main character is a young witch. It has uh, fairy tales and folklore and crafting in it. Turns out my main audience is actually young women because I, you know, that's kind of what I created while not even thinking about it. And it just shows how there's like those unintentional biases uh, by the people that are making those creative decisions on your teams. And so having a diverse team is going to allow you to combat any uh, biases that you might not want and have more perspectives so you can make products that are appealing to a wider audience. Um, something else that I always try to touch on when talking about diversity and the benefits of diversity, you know, even outside of the creative sides of teams, diversity can be helpful. And I mean, diversity of all sorts, whether sure. that is, you know, um, ethnicity or gender identity or um, socioeconomic background or you know, marital status, because uh, all of our experiences inform how we think and process things and how we solve problems. You know, if you have five students from the same college put on a team asked to solve a problem together, they're all probably gonna like five approach it in nearly the same way because that is their experience that they, they had together. If you take five people from completely different backgrounds and put them on the same team and ask them to approach a problem together, they were gonna have different perspectives and the diversity of those perspectives and approaches will help them overcome blockers because one person might have some information or an approach that overcomes something that another person would have a weakness on. And so that's why I think diversity isn't just important in those who are making creative decisions, but literally your whole team, because it makes your exactly. team more effective. Yeah. And I think the biggest way to create diversity in a team is to start early. early. You know, you really, because what happens is it's a, it's a lot harder to do when you, you walk in and there's 20 people that look the same and you look different, you know? Um, and so, so really more and more, we're trying to, to start diversity at the same time, these companies are starting up and make sure it's a, it's a priority um, from the start. And more and more, they want to do it that way. But also the big companies are understanding that diversity is really important. You know, I, you, I was talking to a, a, a writer in the game business, David Walensky, earlier today, and you know he he wrote a lot about um, GamerGate when that happened, and he was kind of finishing a book on on that. And um, you know he had interviewed me almost a decade ago, and then we were kind of revisiting it. And I was trying to be really optimistic. I mean, I think things have really improved. I mean, I think that you know every big company now has has a DEI group and is working hard to to improve the diversity of their teams um, and that just wasn't true 10 years ago yeah absolutely um the iga has actually published um two uh resources along those lines one is uh inclusive game design development and the other is how to create and sustain a positive work culture uh because those are things that you know we're really passionate about uh yeah. that i'm passionate about as well um and i think yeah, I, I think really the main point here is we're making progress, but we're not there yet, right? You know, obviously there's still problems. Uh, obviously, when it comes to true like diversity, we're not quite there. Um, but I think with proactive and sustained effort, we'll get closer and closer every year. Change takes time. I mean, it really does. We see that in society in general. Uh, and there's always sort of a pushback that comes with with change, you know. Yeah. And, and that's part of what happened this that, with this thing called GamerGate that we, that we that I mentioned earlier is that you know there was more of a push to include uh, uh, choice of of, of um, players. You know, when you play a game, I want to play a, a character that looks like me, right? And for some gamers, they didn't like that. Uh, you know, they didn't. That was a change they didn't like. Yeah. Uh, and they let their unhappiness be felt. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can certainly speak to being uh, a young female gamer <laughs> and it was very unwelcoming. Like uh, I was actually, I grew up with first person shooter games. So I was actually a big first person shooter player. Unlike uh, a lot of my peers, I didn't start with- Not the most the welcoming Nintendo, audience. <laughs> right? I mean, I, so I mean, I was playing a lot of uh, single player first person shooter games. So like yeah. Doom, Half-Life, uh, yeah. Duke Nukem, uh, mm -hmm. Wolfenstein 3D. Mm -hmm. And those are all experiences that I enjoyed. I my dad introduced me to Great them. Games, so it was yeah. like a bonding experience for us. Mm -hmm. And then um, some of my friends in middle school started playing this thing called Counter-Strike. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, cool, Counter-Strike, built on the Source engine, kind of like yeah. Half-Life, that'll be super fun. Uh, I logged on for the first time. It's a team got in, game. Yeah. Got in voice <laughs> chat as a 12-year-old girl. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't play Counter-Strike again after that experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... You know, eventually I found some other online games with slightly more welcoming communities, but boy, I, I can't imagine how much talent the game industry has lost out on because of those early experiences being unfortunately toxic to, to some people. And it doesn't matter if what your gender is or, you know, what your background is. The online games can be really toxic sometimes. Uh, I know that we're making strides to help prevent that as well. Um, but I think it's it's something, again, that has to be more proactively addressed to ensure that these communities are not toxic, that they stay fairly welcoming because games are, should be accessible to everyone. Yeah, and it's been hard on some of the women in the business, especially if they have a kind of big role. I mean, some of the women who work in, in mild group at my you know, Microsoft Game Studios, um, think about like Shannon Loftus, who uh, just retired after a long, long career there, but re launched the new Age of Empires there. Um, Bonnie Ross, who runs the Halo franchise, Kiki Wolfkill, who just put out the Halo um, series on, on Paramount Plus. Um, ama amazing individuals, really, really incredible um, trail trailblazers for women in the game business. Um, but it hasn't been easy, uh, you know, it hasn't been easy for them. And so I, hopefully we're, we're making things better for the next generation. Absolutely. Um, my own experience within the game development industry uh, has been relatively smooth. I certainly mm -hmm. haven't had, um, you know, much harassment. Uh, I haven't had, you know, any, any big issues along those lines, but there is this, there has been at least in the past, this constant undercurrent of being subconsciously doubted. Like I remember when I was talking about the game I was developing, uh, people asked me about my team and I would be like, oh, okay, well, I have this person doing art and this person doing audio and this person helping with writing. And then I do everything else. And they would say, well, then who does the programming? It's like, well, I mean, everything else includes that would be the part programming. Of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be me. Uh, or if I was standing next to a, uh, a male peer who was around my age, people would like pass up over me and they'd be, and then later I'd be like, excuse me, like, no, hi, I'm Renee, nice to meet you. They'd be like, oh, sorry, I just thought you were his girlfriend. And it's just those little things, you know, uh, yeah. and I can see you know, some women, it's, it's death by a thousand cuts and they decide that it's not worth sticking around. Um, I'm glad that I, I haven't faced anything more major, but especially early in my career, it was exhausting. And I felt like I had to be overly assertive of myself to ensure that I was being taken seriously. I thankfully, I don't feel like I'm at that point anymore. And so now I just sort of sit back and laugh with people, um, you know, discount me, but, uh, it, it was definitely challenging as I was breaking my way into the industry. Um, hey. What else do we want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I would, so I would love to hear your recommendations and I'll be happy to share mine. If, if someone who's listening to this conversation right now wants to get into the game industry, what yeah. should they do? Yeah. Um, I, a few things. I mean, first of all, getting in that first job is always the hardest. And so if, if you're really passionate about games, uh, the first thing I'd say is don't give up. 
keep keep trying you know find a way to get in because that once you get in uh it's a great place and it's it's very easy to move around once you get in the game business but getting that first job is is the hardest um when i talk to people who want to get in the game business what I really love finding people who just want to make things, whatever it is that they do. That's kind of what I like to see. So I like to see people who show their passion by going beyond just like school assignments or, you know, things like that to actually building stuff on their own because they're excited about it. It's programmers that, you know, they're making games, you know, or maybe they're modding an existing game, which is an easier task to do. If they're artists, you know, artists, artists, can, they're, they're makers by, you know, by definition. So right. they, sh they should be creating whatever kinds of art, you know, they, they like to do. And, and in the game business, we have lots of different kinds of artists from, you know, concept artists to animators to 2D and 3D artists. Uh, um, and I'm sure many of that I didn't mention, not to, you know, and of course, musicians as well are, it's always important in, in, in games. Um, and if none of those things fit, but you're still super passionate about games, you know, of course, game design, game design, I, I honestly think is one of the hardest jobs to get in, in the game business, um, because it sounds like the job everybody wants, you know, it's kind of like saying, oh, I want to be a movie director. You know, that, that sounds like a really fun job. It's like, guess what? You don't get to start out as a movie director. You know, you kind of have to work your way up um, through one of the other disciplines typically. Um, so but you can go to school. Pro there are specific school programmers, programs for becoming a designer. Um, but honestly, beyond a few big school, a few kind of schools that have been doing it for a long time, I think there's a bunch of schools that are just kind of churning out designers and there may not be much of a market for that. So, um, and then of course we are, we need business people and, uh, probably the biggest job I didn't mention is production, just keeping, you know, keeping the team on schedule, you know, yeah. uh, making sure that we're getting done what we need to get done and we don't get, um, you know, unfocused because the designer had a great new idea overnight you know? um, absolutely uh, when, you know and so um but all those things i think the most important thing is to show the initiative of, of making something working with a group of people building something or doing it on your own um and, and being able to show kind of a portfolio of work that's what that's what i love to see how about you i would say the exact same i think that i uh when I provide uh, that advice, I say specifically, do a tutorial, just get familiar with an engine or something, yeah. you know, figure out a way to make things. And, you know, if you're an artist, make sure you understand what like a sprite sheet is or whatever mm -hmm. you want to, to play with on that regard. And then do game jams. There are many, yeah. many, many game jams. And the mm -hmm. benefit of a game jam, uh, for those who don't know, is that you're working on developing a very small game in a short period of time, often like 72 hours. And you are, you know, you get to join a team where people have different uh, skills and experiences and you work together and you get to learn so much in such a short period of time. And you come out with something that shows that you are going above and beyond to make things. You get items for your portfolio. And as Ed says, that's so important. It's exactly what you need to, to show that you did something other than just get a degree. Um, and oftentimes those game jam experiences or any time you work on a project with other people, not only do you learn a ton, um, but you form connections and make friends. And the game industry, despite being a $200 billion industry now, uh, is one that is really based on those connections. As long as you learn how to work well exactly. with others and you start building that, that network, like that will support you for the rest of your career. I'd be nowhere uh, in, in <laughs> games without you know the, the peers and mentors and people I've connected with over the years because I've learned so much from them and been given so many opportunities through my connections with them. So yeah, my recommendation is get some basic skills, do some tutorials, and then do game jams. You'll learn a lot. And once you start learning more, I would even say do a game jam in a role that you're not used to. So if you're like, I'm a game yeah, programmer, and all you do is like 
listen to a designer and program gameplay, maybe mm -hmm. you should try to be a designer a uh, time, or maybe mm -hmm. you should try to be an artist and see what artists have to struggle with. They'll give you appreciation for good art pipelines and how to build them so your artists are, are happier. Um, games are so complex and they require so many disciplines to come together. The more that you can understand and empathize with the people that you're collaborating with, the more effective a developer you'll be. And that will that'll make the games that you work on better, that'll make the, your experience on teams easier, and it'll make you a more appreciated developer, no matter what your role is. I don't know if you've ever done this one. I've heard, I heard there's something called Train Jam, where they train, train Jam. Yeah, yeah. yeah Adrian Wallach runs it. Right. So doesn't it run from Chicago to San Francisco? For GDC. Yeah. For GDC. So, so you arrive at GDC after jamming on a train for 72 hours. <laughs> I find GDC the whole week to be very tiring. So exactly. I don't know if I could add like three days to it or whatever that train ride is. Uh, but I know a lot of people have done um, Train Jam, really appreciate it. I believe some fairly successful indie titles were started uh, on Train Jam. So Super cool. yeah, they didn't run it this year, obviously, pandemic, uh, but I'm sure it'll be back next year. So uh, that'll be early March for those of you who are considering uh, just before GDC. So definitely check it out. Um, yeah, and uh, one thing I, I wanted to go over, I know that you touched on all of the disciplines, but just so that uh, people are aware of them, I would say that the, the core disciplines that are usually considered in like the core development team are art, pretty self-explanatory what art is. Uh, engineers, engineers actually have a huge range of what they do. Not only are they gameplay engineers, which are making things happen in the game, but you're looking at graphics engineers and system engineers and tools engineers, really creating things that either run the game or run the creation of the game, like uh, enable people to be more effective. So there's all sorts of different types of engineering. And so if you're interested in more design-like problems or working with artists or working with audio people, like that mm -hmm. application is different. There is, of course, audio. Um, that is probably one of the hardest ones to get into. Uh, there is design, and I'm going to group writing and narrative under design because yeah. they, they often go hand in hand there. Mm -hmm. And design, again, has many iterations. But if you want to be a good and effective designer, you should know how to program or you should really love spreadsheets, and ideally both, um, because they're you know, maybe if you're just a level designer. See more fans of Excel. Right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, I know a lot of uh, system designers who are just like all about Excel. It's like their favorite <laughs> tool in the world. Uh, and then, as you said, production. Um, I spent most of my career as a producer, actually. So I'm well aware of the challenges of producer. I, I think for people who aren't used to game development, they s initially see producers as managers, which is not the case right. at all. Like exactly. producers. Producers are enablers of the team that help the team scope and understand the problems they're tackling and approach it in a way that is going to allow them to be successful to meet their goals and milestones. Um, they're, and you, you know who we're forgetting, the group that is probably um, the most important to me when I was running Microsoft's game business was the testers. Uh, yes. They were the ones who I could talk to and find out what was really going on in the project where things really were and if they worked or not and to your point you know the producers sometimes wanted to be act like they were in charge of the project it was like no you guys are all at the same level the testers the producers the programmers the artists you all need to work together you know to get this thing done and um it's, sometimes it's it's important to elevate the testers to that same level you know right to, to make sure everyone has a voice in the in the team right yeah, well, and I would say that there's a lot of um, other types of like support outside of like the core development team. Obviously, like gameplay mm -hmm. testers are super important, and having good testers that are integrated well into your team is going to make you far more effective at that iteration of development. Uh, there's and also, it can be course, another it can be another great way to get into game into game development. To, I, yeah, many I many famous designers started as testers and worked their way up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know many, many, many people in the industry mm -hmm. who who started. Um, I know a lot of people who did like uh, 
game tester internship at Nintendo while going to like a, a guy while going to school and then mm -hmm. afterwards you know went and got a, a different job within the industry um but of course there's marketers and business developers oh, yeah. and <laughs> lawyers and people in finance and people in HR like there are so many different ro uh, roles within the industry yeah. uh, that support the monolith that it is <laughs> Um, but we're almost to uh, 15 yeah, minutes we left, take some so we should, yeah, we should definitely take some questions. All right, well, thank you both. Um, Renee, could you repeat the name of the Zelda-like game you created? Um, we do have someone who want to check it out. Yes, I will actually just provide a link to it. Um, and it, then... It's in the chat, it's called Potions the Curious Tale. Perfect, thank you. And so if someone is interested in starting a game company, would their freshman year in college be a good time to start or should they kind of wait, you know, after senior year or so? So, so we typically don't invest in, um, in companies unless they have um, left their job at a previous company or left school and are, are full-time committed to, to running a game company. Um, you know, normally we invest pretty early, um, but um, but they have to have at least have the core team. Kind of usually, it's you know a, te a great technical person, a great design person, a great art person. That's kind of the core of a of a startup in the game business. Um, if they kind of have that together, and hopefully they have some startup experience, some business experience as well among one or more of those three, uh, but I really like to see them at least established as a team. Um, sometimes that means they do a, a, they raise a little money first, kind of friends and family money it's called uh, from race, <laughs> like it sounds like raise it from their friends and family. And that lets them, you know, kind of get the business started. Uh, and then they come out to bigger venture firms like, like the one I run. I uh, similarly would, caution against putting the cart before the horse. You don't need a official business entity to start making games, right? Mm -hmm. I would say, try to make a game first and then figure out if you need a business to actually like, you know, market, sell, whatnot, your game. Uh, if you have multiple people working on it, get at least some basic agreement of like, oh, we'll split the profits 50-50 or uh, we'll base it on the numbers of hours we work and we'll try to roughly track that. Uh, but outside of that, I wouldn't worry about the business part of it. I would worry about making something that's fun because you can have a business and you can be working on things. But if you don't have a fun product, you don't really have a game studio. You just have some weird legal entity that you have to manage, um, which is unnecessary overhead. So make a fun game first, work on a like at least a prototype, uh, and then you can worry about the business side of things. Good advice. Great, thank you for the advice. Um, we do have a current student who's interested in uh, designing video games, mm -hmm. but they're worried about being able to support the community doing it. Could you describe some ways that you have contributed to the community either through or around your career? I, I guess I would need additional clarification of which yeah. community. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't quite understand the question. Great, we'll come back to that question. Um, how do you support independent game developers and is virtual reality the next evolutionary step? Definitely two completely different questions. So we'll try to go through them pretty quickly. Um, as for the venture fund, what, what we do that really none, none of the other game funds do is we focus on community. We focus on connecting all the founders of, of the companies that we invest in into this tight group. And we, we do a lot of, of communication between them. So everybody's connected on Slack. Every, we do um, several times a month Zoom calls where everybody gets together and they talk about what problems they're having with their game company and how, and they share with each other how they overcame similar problems. Um, and so that's really what, uh, what One Up is all about. It's what, what, we, what we bring when we invest in, in game companies. Um, as far as VR goes, uh, what happens in, in, I think a lot of, you know, sort of tech related businesses is there's this thing called the Gartner hype cycle. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's like a curve that goes like way up and then it goes way down and then it kind of comes out somewhere in the middle. 
And what that means is like people get super overhyped about something and they invest way too much money and way too many companies. And then, um, and then they over at some point the pendulum swings the other way and they think, oh, this is a disaster. And, you know, and then, and then the curve goes way down as far as investment goes. And then at some point it becomes stable in the middle. And that's sort of the, what we've gone through with VR in the last five years is that people got really excited about it from an investment point of view. And then people got really unexcited about it. But, the, but if you looked at like the number of VR headsets that are installed and in use, it's been increasing steadily every year. So it should just look like a line that goes up, but the investor excitement goes like this. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, so VR is, you know, it's definitely improving. The technology is getting better, um, but, you know, but it's, it's not, um, it's not going to like take over the world of the game business uh, um, tomorrow. Um, it needs to continue to evolve and get better is my opinions. Um, yeah. So from the, uh, IGDA side of things in regards to how we support independent game developers. We actually just have a lot of resources that are intended to make game developers' lives as easy as possible. Um, you know, for example, if you are an you know, official indie studio with people trying to come into the office, uh, one of the things that might be too expensive is to hire an HR professional. And so we have like an HR a handbook guideline that you could just use to figure out how to make a HR policies that's going to cover you know, your studio. Of course, we have lots of um, resources when it comes to disciplines and things like that. You know, similarly to One Up Ventures, we have a community. Uh, ours is less focused, but also uh, large because we have like ten thousand members. So we have a Discord group with like five thousand game developers on it. Wonderful advice channel. It's discord.gg slash IGDA. If you want to join it yourself, you can put your portfolio in there, put your resume in there if you'd like advice. And there's you know professional game developers who will review that and, and assist you on that front. Uh, and if you are an indie dev, uh, again, people will like play test your game, give you feedback, give you feedback on your pitch if you'd like. Um, and then uh, IGDA does have memberships and we actually bias our studio memberships to be really, really supportive of indie studios. So our indie studio membership is extremely cheap uh, for up to 15 developers and it comes with a lot of like free marketing. So uh, we do um, like game spotlights, we, we host them. Uh, we ran a indie game, sh like IGDA indies uh, show uh, with Twitch partnership, got like 50,000 viewers, 14,000 concurrent, something like that. I, I don't remember the exact numbers now, um, but we definitely try to uplift indie developers as much as possible because so much, uh, so much creativity and a lot of like the, the lifeblood of excitement I find like sustains very well in the indie side of our industry. Uh, yeah. Oh, and as for I, ER, I, I, I agree with Ed. <laughs> I, I want to, um, you kind of you kind of merged kind of chapters and SIGs in there, but I think that's a really good resource to, you might want to mention a little right. more about chapters and SIGs just so people know what that is. Absolutely. So uh, the IGDA uh, also has local chapters which support, support their local game development community. Uh, I just moved to Vancouver, so uh, I'm partaking in IGDA Vancouver's first meetup post-pandemic. Uh, and it's a place to network, share information. Uh, I know IGDA Seattle hosts a lot of talks, uh, usually on a monthly basis. Those are great local communities and you know, building those local bonds can be a, a bit more uh, close than you know, building bonds across the world. The other thing that Ed mentioned are SIGs or special interest groups. We have special interest groups across uh, different affinities and disciplines. So we have women in games and black in games and LGBTQ plus. We also have game designers, uh, game writers, uh, game um, community managers, things like that. And these are all discipline-based groups or affinity-based groups or even interest-based groups. We have a climate SIG. Uh, that come together to share their knowledge and resources and support. Uh, and those can be really, really valuable. We actually also have a student special interest group. So uh, students today can, can join that one and, and connect with other students and support each other as well. Thanks for bringing that up, Ed.
Very cool. Thank you. A uh, question about how do you get a company to focus on creating a diverse team from the beginning of that team? Well, I, we wrote that uh, inclusive game design development, which is all about that. <laughs> uh, so I've been talking about it. Actually, I gave a presentation at Pocket Gamer Connects. Uh, actually, no, I gave it at um, WN Seattle, my bad. Uh, but I think it is showing that it's an important thing to consider. Uh, I think that really a lot of times the numbers speak for themselves. Game developers, uh, particularly larger studios, often look at market data and seeing that those games are effective at appealing to a lot of people are gonna make them consider it earlier. I know that um, some AAA teams are starting to think about accessibility uh, and doing like pre dives into those considerations prior to the starting the game development. And you know that's what we need to do is just talk about the importance of this and ensuring that everyone understands how to get involved with those considerations as early in the game development process as possible, because it's a lot easier to design a diverse game, an inclusive game, an accessible game, uh, if you're thinking about that from day one. Great, thank you. So how do you finish a small solo project without getting interested in a new idea before you're done? Willpower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the, what are the, what does it say? The last 10% is the, the hardest, uh, the 90%, 90% of the work or something is the last 10%. Yeah, something like that. The first 90% uh, of the game takes 90% of the time. The last 10% of the game takes the other 90% of the time. <laughs> there you go. That's a different yeah. way to say it. Um, yeah. It depends. I think it honestly, I think it depends what you're doing. Like I, I heard advice once for, for novel writers was, was to just like write your first novel and then throw it away and then write some more and throw them away. And you know, and learn from each of them until you until you, you know, go into, you know, and if you're like if the very first game you write has to be the masterpiece, you know, you're putting so much pressure on yourself. You know, I think it's better to to choose small projects and and learn from them and and do multiple things and um, you know at some point you'll you'll be ready to do your masterpiece. But you know it may it may not make sense to do that last ten percent. Uh, that's that's so hard. It it may, it may make sense just to move move on and and start something new with with what you've learned on this first project. Sometimes. I think. Yeah, I think something that is really notable about games and a successful way to develop games is iteration. And you have to have something playable to iterate on it to make it better. And so getting to first playable and, and getting like the rough you know, version of the game out and then iterating on it is a far more effective way of development than trying to start with like the perfect tutorial, right? Because you're not going to make the perfect tutorial without understanding what your full game even is. So if you are working on your whole game, the experience and iterating on that, you know, you do a vertical, like, do a prototype, do a vertical slice, build out your game and iterate and iterate and iterate. If you get it 90% of the way there, you should still have a playable functional game. You know, if you get burnt out, you can just send it out the door. Uh, and I think that that gives you a lot more freedom and flexibility because some people are perfectionists and they never feel like they're done. Uh, and some people do want to hop to another project. And I think making sure that you have a cohesive playable game as early as possible is going to give you the most potential for success of actually shipping it. Yeah, I know I say, Shigeru, Shigeru, I Shigeru Miyamoto is, you know, the, the probably the world's most famous game designer created Mario, you know, and he uh, he used to hate when people would walk in with like big design paper design documents because it's like what is that? how do you know it's like it's like I he he would insist that the team would just create a character and just make it fun just to run around with the character you know and if, if you can make that fun then you can make the rest of the game fun right uh, absolutely great right, thank you so a question for Renee. So you both talked about being in an industry where a lot of things can go wrong. To what extent was failure embraced or not at MUD while you were there? And what did that mean for you? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much I can say failure specifically being embraced at MUD. I would say that MUD was a huge learning experience for me because maybe like many students, 
prior to MUD, I wasn't challenged. You know, I was valedictorian. I excelled at most things. Um, and MUD was the first time that I faced potential failure. Like I got a, more C's than I wanted, I want to admit. Um, some classes I barely scraped by. Uh, and I think that was actually a super valuable experience for me because if I had gone to a less challenging school, I might not have learned how to deal with lack of perfection, with you know not knowing everything. Um, I think that MUD set me up well for game development by being difficult. Um, and it, I can't say it was easy. I mean, it sucked, I worried, I had nightmares, I mean, it's been like maybe six or eight months since my last college nightmare, um, but they still come by. I don't, I don't know, Ed, how long it's been since you last had a school nightmare, but I know many people who have them very, very long in their lives. Um, but yeah, I, I think that for me- I used, I used to have a school nightmare about that had to do with like going to the school, um, like our, our mailboxes to get pick up my mail. And I have that, and there was always like some problem getting my little PO box open. And then I went back and I visited my college about 10 years ago and, th and that building was gone. Like they had, they, and I never had that dream again. It was great. <laughs> like, like I got rid of the PO boxes and they moved them somewhere. Nice. Yeah, but I would say that my, I don't, yeah, I didn't fail any classes, thankfully, um, but MUD set me up for tackling challenges that I couldn't handle perfectly well and learning how to be resourceful and learning how to be okay with just being okay sometimes uh, because you can't be perfect at everything. You can't be an expert at everything. It's fun to try, um, but yeah, that's how I feel like fun set me up well in that regard. Great, thank you. So we are coming up on the hour. Um, I wanted to ask, Ed or Renee, if you have any last minute advice to our, you know, anyone that wants to get into the game industry that you haven't said already. I love the game industry. You know, I really do. It's, um, it, it's uh, just been such an important part of my life. And um, like I said, I love going back every year to GDC and just reconnecting with, with old friends and I feel like what we're doing in the business is really important. You know, I, I think we're we're entertaining people around the world, and um, you know, we're creating a new a new medium of expression um, that um, I think is as important as as books or movies or plays. Um, and I think that this time will be looked back on it in the future as a time when this new medium emerged that was really really critical to the world, so. I would say um, explore, have fun with it, right? Like games are supposed to be fun. You can't capture fun if you're not having fun with development. <laughs> Don't set yourself up with like, I need to make the next Stardew Valley. And if my game is not as successful as Stardew Valley, I'm an utter failure. Like, just try to have fun, make something that your friends will enjoy that you can share with them and share your knowledge and learnings. You know, the best way to cement yourself within the industry is to uplift others because they'll remind you, they'll, they'll remember you as somebody who helps them as, and that will establish you as an expert that will establish you as a nice person to work with. Um, yeah, so have fun and don't be a jerk. I guess would be my two main pieces of advice. Uh, I'm also gonna throw a link in the chat. Uh, I have a short talk I've done before about personal leadership and it's all about how to like grow your career and plan how to be successful at the things you want. So feel free to check that out. It, it covers a lot of things there and it's not too long. So hopefully you'll find that useful. I'm, I'm glad and you said that. I'm glad you said that Renee because that's, I, I used to call it helping friends having fun. Um, so you just totally nailed that. Nice. Yeah. Well, awesome. We are on the hour. Um, all our audience member links will be sent with a follow-up email. So don't worry about writing them all down or copying them all down. I will send it out to you. Um, I want to thank Renee and Ed for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and insights with us. Thank you to our audience for your questions and for attending this event. 
We will follow up within the next week with the recorded video and the follow-up email. If you are interested in being a Mud Talk speaker, please contact us at alumni at hmc.edu. Future events can be found on our website by visiting alumni.hmc.edu. Other than that, thanks again for joining us and have a great night. We'll see you next time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Bye. Bye.